Welcome to Making Tracks, which this week comes from the Midland Railway Centre. You know, they've done an enormous amount of work to provide a wealth of entertainment for the visitors. They certainly have. And we'll have more of this later on. But first, we're off to South Africa, where, incredibly enough, isolated mainline steam still operates on service trains. Clark stop at dawn on a July Saturday in 1994 provides a sight that many people would have thought was a thing of the past. A pair of Class 25 NCs backing onto the Trans Karoo Dining Car Express for the 180 mile run back to Johannesburg. This is a weekly event, with the Express being steam hauled out to Clerkstorp on the Friday and returning on the Saturday. Incredibly enough, these locos are cheaper to operate than diesels or electrics. And the main reason that these highly advanced machines were phased out was that steam had simply become unfashionable here by the late 1980s. Britain went through the same process some 30 years ago, and the obsession to go diesel and electric at all costs robbed the steam locomotive of some of its finest years. The 25 NCs were developed by North British of Glasgow and the German manufacturers Henschels long after British Railways had lost interest in the steam locomotive. This resulted in a highly sophisticated and efficient design. It's gratifying to know that South African Railways are still allowing these locos to show off their potential in a country which for so many years has produced some of the finest steam spectacles in the world. to the north of Britain now for some more steam on the main lines. On the 25th of September 1993, an excursion ran from Carnforth to Scarborough in the capable hands of Stania 8F number 48151, providing our first sight of this class at work on the main line. Introduced by the LMS in 1934, these robust 280 locomotives were used almost exclusively for freight work. Occasionally some were pressed into passenger service, especially during the busy summer holiday period, providing fine spectacles such as this. This was a numerous class and many were shipped overseas during the war, primarily to Turkey and the Middle East. Six hundred and sixty-three locos were absorbed into the British Railways fleet on nationalisation and some remained in service right up until the end of steam in 1968. Eight have been preserved, and number 48151 is an example of a fine piece of restoration by the Midland Railway Centre. A 
An interesting combination of locos was seen at work on the 7th of August 1994 on a run to Fort William as part of the West Highland Line Centenary celebrations. 260 class K1, number 2005, was joined by three-cylinder class K4, number 3442, the Great Marquis. And both looked splendid in LNER apple green livery, although number 2005 was built after nationalization and so only ever ran in BR black. Class K4s were designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, and six were built in 1937 for use on the West Highland Line. One of these was converted to a two-cylinder locomotive and reclassified K1, forming the prototype for a class of 70 engines, of which number 2005 is the only survivor. Steam working through the Scottish landscape is a magnificent sight and visitors to Scotland during the summer months will find regular steam trains operating between Fort William and Malague. Our final look at steam on the main line is of the world's fastest and most famous steam locomotive, A4 Pacific Mallard. Here she is, put through her paces during her release from the National We head back down south to the borders of the New Forest in Hampshire, home of the Moores Valley Miniature Railway. Situated on the edge of Ringwood Forest, the railway was built on a former dairy farm, and many of the original farm buildings have been converted and modified, including the station, engine shed, and main workshops. There is a wealth of locos and rolling stock, many items having come from a former miniature railway centre near Christchurch. The style of these locomotives is best described as a miniature narrow gauge and came about largely due to the influence of the seven and a quarter inch gauge society. This large fleet is maintained to very high standards using the railway's comprehensive workshop facilities. The most striking thing about a visit to the line is the sheer scale of locomotive operation, and a trip on this railway is a fascinating experience. Open coaching stock is the order of the day here, although tucked away in the carriage shed is a set of fully enclosed carriages which are brought out for an airing on special occasions. With up to six trains on the track at peak times, signalling is taken seriously. It's strictly controlled and observed in accordance with VR procedures. The route is a mile long and a train ride takes about eight to ten minutes. It takes longer on busy days due to signal hold-ups and shunting operations.
shunting duties at the time of our visit was in the hands of number four, Tinkerbell. This 042 tank loco is one of the early engines, built in 1968 by Roger Marsh of Coventry. The latest engine to join the fleet is number 12, Pioneer, which was named at an official ceremony attended by the Territorial Army in 1993. The main lever frame at Kingsmere signal box came from Beckton Gas Works in East London, with bells, bell pushes, and other instruments obtained from the sales of redundant BR equipment. Much thought and planning has gone into the layout of the line, with tunnels, bridges, and spirals, all adding to the busy railway scene. The seven and a quarter inch gauge line was built with aluminium rails on wooden sleepers. The total track length, including sidings, is about one and a half miles. Approximately 8,000 sleepers, 500 tons of ballast and 100 tons of roadstone have been used in the construction of the track. Unlike other seven and a quarter inch gauge lines, the locos are large enough for the driver to sit inside the cab. Indeed, until Tinkerbell was built in 1968, it wasn't thought possible to build an engine of these proportions for this gauge. Since then, much larger locos have been built, one of the most powerful being number 11, Zeus, which resembles a South African design. At the other end of the scale is number three, Talos, a tiny 042 tank locomotive built in 1978. It looks superb in maroon livery and is seen shunting around the depot. Incidentally, all the engines are deliberately painted in different liveries to provide an even more colorful look to the railway. The railway is in the Moors Valley Country Park near Ringwood on the Dorset Hampshire border, which, in addition to the line, has a visitor center, adventure playground, picnic areas, and numerous forest walks. Needless to say, the railway is one of the main attractions, with even freight trains being featured. This one consists of side tipping skip wagons used when the line was first built to move such bulky items as spoiled from earthworks. Like so many other miniature railways in the country, variety and interest are the main theme, and the Moors Valley Railway has certainly achieved this in no small measure. Why not pay a visit to the Moors Valley Country Park and its railway, and see for yourself? We move now to South Devon, where a beautiful area of woodland is the setting for the Gorse Blossom Miniature Railway. This is without doubt one of the finest locations for a miniature line in the country, with trains running through many wooded glades, providing some superb sights. The railway has some steep gradients with viaducts, tunnels and bridges having had to be built due to the hilly nature of the terrain. The result is a fascinating run, attracting thousands of visitors every year from all over Britain. The owner of this delightful line is Jeff Kitchenside. He explained how it came into being. It was a working farm originally, but the uh, new extra Plymouth A38 dual carriageway split it in two and left just the woodland with very little farmland. And in the woods, there's a number of hills and valleys and uh, all miniature sized, ideal for a, a miniature railway park. In addition to the railway, there are many extra attractions in which the visitor can participate and plenty here to keep the children amused. There's a model railway recreating a Swiss mountain atmosphere. Come on, have a look. Come on, here it comes. Come on, 
The steam loco at work on the line is a miniature replica of an old Linton and Barnstable railway design. The original loco was itself narrow gauge. The Linton and Barnstable railway sadly no longer exists. It was one of the few narrow gauge lines in the country built primarily to haul passengers. A stop at the station provides an opportunity for a closer look at the little loco named Yo. It's superbly detailed and in fine form. It gives pleasure to the many visitors who travel behind it. Hi. Hi. Two services were operating at the time of our visit, the miniature electric loco complementing the steam working. An intensive service was provided throughout the day. Indeed, it was a pleasure just to sit and watch the trains go by. <laughs> With the Dartmoor National Park as a backdrop, and the large holiday resorts of the Torbay area nearby, the Gorse Blossom Railway is ideally situated to provide a great day out for the many holidaymakers who visit the area. Let's leave you with some views of this fascinating little railway and its woodland settings. A fitting finale to our look at some of the best miniature lines to be found in Britain. From small beginnings, the Midland Railway Centre has built up its operations to become one of the most varied and interesting preserved lines in the country. The Railway Centre near Ripley in Derbyshire certainly has much to offer. Alan Caradine, you're the development manager of the Midland Railway. It's not just a railway, is it? Far from it. The railway is obviously a major part of what the Midland Railway Centre is about. But there is much more to it than just the steam railway that you can see. We have a narrow gauge line, we have miniature railways, various model railways, we've got a huge museum, we've even got a country park and a farm park. So the ra a visit to the railway by any member of the public is a full day out rather than just a trip on the train. Do you own the site? The site itself is owned by the County Council uh, and is on a long-term lease to the Midland Railways Trust and we continue to operate it in partnership with the County Council. Well, how did you start? <laughs> we started back in 1969, very much as a local authority project in those days and gradually the local authorities have pulled out and the volunteers of the Midland Railway Trust have taken control of the project and taken it on to operating railways to keeping in touch with everybody that's uh, got museum items that might be available and continue to grow the project as it's, uh, as it's developed. Well, what is your future then? The future of the project is very much to continue along the lines that we've gone. We've got a lot of development work to do in the museum site. Uh, in the immediate future, we're extending the narrow gauge railway. We've got two branch lines to build. We've got a road transport building, which is going to be a, a road transport museum, which now wants completing. And then they're looking to new projects in the future, which are the Diesel Museum, which is the major one. And then various other projects along the country park, uh, a lot more restoration work to carry on. We've got a lot of work to keep us going for the next couple of hundred years without any problem.
The garden railway, situated at Butterley Station, is an unusual find for a preserved steam centre. Lying alongside the standard gauge track, it's an interesting comparison for the visitors and draws a large audience when operating at weekends. Moving up a scale, we visit the miniature railway, which can be found at Swanwick Junction and which runs on Sundays throughout the summer. A variety of superb model steam locos can be seen, all requiring just as much care and attention as their full-size counterparts. This three and a half and five inch gauge line runs for approximately one sixth of a mile. It is fully controlled using miniature examples of traditional railway signals, operated from a miniature Midland railway signal box and is one of the many attractions that can be seen at the large Swanwick Junction site. The Midland Railway Centre also offers an unusual charter facility, which has proved to be very popular. For those getting married who want a wedding reception with a difference, why not have it on a steam hall special train? On the day of our visit, newlyweds Alison and Rob, plus families and guests, descended on Butterley Station, where the mobile reception was waiting. The weather stayed fine for photographs and other formalities, and the sight of the special train, plus the many guests on the platform at Butterley, aroused much interest from the other passengers. There's much attention to detail, and the railway staff put in an enormous amount of work to make sure these events are a success. The wedding bell made two round trips on the line, slotting in between the regular services. We were lucky enough to travel with the party, and we asked Alison why they chose to have their reception on a steam train. We chose it because of my dad. Dad's been a steam train book for years, and like every, every holiday we spent was next door to Steam Preservation Society, so we've been literally bought up on it, me and my sisters. Why this particular line? Dad spends a lot of time up here, he's got friends up here, and um, that's why we came here. We come here quite a lot. Alison, can I be very rude and say, what would you say if there were an opportunity to go on the engine? What would you do? I'll come with you. Just like that? Yeah. And you wouldn't mind getting on? No, the... I'd love to go on the train. Uh, change, change all the skin and just get on? I'd go on like this. <laughs> would you? It's not mine, so I'd go on. <laughs> With all the diversity of attractions that the railway has to offer, it's easy to forget the main reason for the centre's existence, the recreation of an authentic Midland railway scene and the chance to see a fine array of standard gauge locomotives at work. We began this series with a trip to Japan and that's where we're going to end. So let's go back to this remarkable country and its railways. Takasaki is in the Gunma district, 150 miles northwest of Tokyo. This is part of the Japan Railway East system and the main line from Naigata to Tokyo runs through here. Alongside the electric depot is the original steam shed and this has been rebuilt to house and maintain a D-51 class loco, which every Saturday takes a train to the old spa town of Minakami. The D-51 class was designed as a heavy goods loco. They were built between 1936 and 1945. These 282s had some innovations such as mechanical stokers and coal pushers in the fender. They were fairly light engines weighing in at 77 tons. The warm April day at the time of this visit turned quickly to snow as the train made the climb into the Naigata Mountains, seen here passing Numata. 
At Minakami, the engine was serviced at the depot which once housed the steam banking locos used to assist the trains on the long, hard climbs in this area. Minakami itself is a popular resort for the Japanese. The fine array of old temples and the health-giving baths associated with the spa town attracts people from all over the country. The steam specials that run here adds to the influx of visitors. There are large numbers of railway enthusiasts in Japan and many braved the weather to see steam in action. The return journey saw the D-51 crossing the Tonegawa River at Shibukawa, giving us a final look at one of the many preserved steam operations to be found in a country more readily associated with modern technology. Well, that's the end of this series of Making Tracks. We hope you've enjoyed watching the programmes as much as we've enjoyed making them. Yes, and we hope to be back soon with more of the best in railways, both here...